How many people here have hiked to Mamak Hill? Okay, that's a pretty good turnout for hikers. Well, you're going to learn that you probably are missing a lot out there on the ground as you walk up and um, probably break a little sweat and huff and puff. Um, we have folks here tonight who have spent a lot of time in that place, who know a lot about that place, uh, have some of the deep history of it uh, that they'll share tonight. Tonight's speakers are all great examples of people committed to preservation archaeology. Paul and Suzanne Fish have spent uh, literally the majority of their careers here in Tucson. They have conducted research at a range of major archaeological sites here in the Tucson Basin, and they've tried to share that information broadly with the public. They've tried to protect those places. Uh, the site of Los Morteros on the north side of town. Uh, they were instrumental in getting that on the map, and Pima County now holds uh, <clears throat> a major ownership, and, and you can access that, that place to uh, actually experience that. They're still working on the Marana Mound um, up in a platform mound up on the north side of, of the Tucson Basin, uh, but also long-term research at Tumamak Hill that they'll share with you tonight. Bernard Siqueiros has been a board member of Archaeology Southwest. Uh, Bernard has been the education director um, out at the new cultural center. He'll touch on that tonight. Um, <clears throat> a man with a deep uh, cultural uh, heritage in this southern Southwest. Um, and all these three people will share a lot of really exciting stories with you tonight. Bernard Siqueiros, thank you for coming tonight. And Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Bill mentioned uh, deep history of this place that we're going to talk about today. And I want to start with sharing, you, sharing with you the deep history that I know about this special place is that um, we as autumn refer to it as Chumamak or Chimamak Hill. Uh, when the Spanish or the non-indigenous people came into contact with our ancestors and, and tried to decipher the words that we shared with them, they would often, uh, in their writings, would often change a letter for a various sound. And so like um, the village that they came into, which we called uh, uh, they added a T and made it Tucson, uh, which now is Tucson. Uh, so Chumamak became Tumamak. But to us, Chumamak means Horned Lizard Hill or Horned Lizard Mountain. And so that's what we're going to discuss today. But uh, for those of you who are fairly new to this area, I wanted to uh, show, uh, show a map of our of our lands, uh, you see the outline of our nation today, which is um, one of the largest in the nations in the United States, 2.8 million square acres of land divided up currently into 11 political districts. Districts are like counties that make up a state. That's our nation today. When we look at the larger map, the San Pedro River to the to the east, uh, the Salt River and the Gila Rivers to the north, the Colorado to the west, the, along the Sea of Cortez, down the Sonoran River. These lands are what we refer to as the lands of our songs and our stories. Uh, these are the lands that our ancestors were very familiar with because these were the lands that they lived in. They farmed, they hunted, they gathered throughout this en entire area. And we know this because of the stories that tell us about our history. Many of our stories talk about areas outside of what our nation is today. Also, those songs that are sung today, those traditional songs that were handed down from generation to generation, when, when singers of songs sit to sing, they can actually take us on a tour of all of our traditional lands through song. 
and all of these traditional, many of these traditional lands are outside of what our nation is today. They may sing about the Pinacates in Mexico. They may sing about the mountains that surround Tucson. They may sing about the mountains around the Phoenix, Phoenix Valley and bring us back to the lands that we're, we're very familiar with today. Uh, also, uh, the Spanish were the first group of people that came in contact with our ancestors that began to write down everything that they saw. So this is the first time that we, we, we experience written history through the eyes of the Spanish. And then archaeologists today that have found evidence of our ancestry throughout this entire area. And so there are names, traditional names for many of these areas that our ancestors were very familiar with. The mountain, the big mountain you call the Catalinas, we refer to as Babatoac, which means Frog Mountain. The, uh, the Rincons to the west of the Tucson Valley, uh, we refer to as uh, Toa Kuswa, which means uh, Turkey Neck. <laughs> and then the mountains to the south, we, we refer to as Jiudoag, or Long Mountain. Uh, there's even some mountains in the Tucson area which I won't tell you where exactly it is, but we call it high, uh, we call it Panapit, uh, which in our language means uh, to be um, politically correct. I would have to say um, coyote droppings. <laughs> and so there are many names with these areas that our ancestors were very familiar with, including Chumamak Doak or or uh, Tumamak, as you refer to it today. I think the, the first time that I experienced, um, I had always, I was always aware that it was a cultural site. Uh, we were told that, th that many areas throughout this area were, were areas that our ancestors resided in, uh, but I had never had the opportunity to go up to Chumamak until uh, uh, Paul and, and Susie took a group from our nation and a group from the University of Arizona uh, to, to discuss uh, the preservation of, of that hill, of that mountain. And so uh, I got a chance to go with the group and um, I was very amazed at the archeology span that I saw there, uh, the evidence of the homes that were built on top of that mountain, uh, the areas where women would sit and grind mesquite beans or corn I was telling Susie that when I first saw that, that large boulder with all of those mortars, that uh, I could envision the women and the girls sitting there working together and just talking and enjoying uh, their, each other's company as they worked to prepare food for their families. Uh, the artwork on the stones that were there, the petroglyphs that, that we saw was strong evidence of our of our ancestry in that area. And we began to think about why would they want to live on top of this hill? And we realized that maybe it was because they felt a little safer. Um, maybe they went and they farmed the area along the Santa Cruz River and then, and then came and, and would spend, would lived up on the hill but would farm the, the lowlands along that river. There were many, many ideas that were shared with each other about, about that area. Of course, nobody really knows for sure, but we, we were able to, at least we had fun discussing some of the reasons why we were there. And uh, our elders certainly are, are very interested in looking at and, and, and learning again about and sharing their knowledge about many of these areas. We have at, at Himdaki, the Nation's Cultural Center Museum, a program we refer to as community enrichment programs where we invite the community to come and just like tonight, we have specific topics that we want to speak about or we have speakers come in to talk about and people from the community will come and learn about various uh, activities that have gone on in our nation. And we also take them on field trips to various sites. And so uh, when um, we announced that we were going to take a field trip to the Mission Gardens in Tucson and up to Chumamakdoak, uh, we had to turn people away. There were so many people that wanted to come, and we only had so many vans that we could, we could bus the, the, um, 
the people that wanted to come. And so we spent time up on Chilmomak, again, learning about that area. And the people that came with us were very thankful that, uh, that they saw and with their own eyes those areas that were once a part of our, our ancestry. In 2000, I was hired by the Tohono O'odham Nation to uh, coordinate uh, all that needed to be coordinated to uh, build and, or to design and build a museum for the Tohono O'odham Nation that would serve as a center to preserve our history and our culture and to teach that history and, our, and that culture to our young people, to our own members. And so we went through the process and, uh, and identified a, an architectural design firm that we wanted to uh, contract with to design this facility. We realized very quickly that this architectural design firm knew very little about who we were as a people, knew very little about our history. And so we spent the first two, three weeks of their contract, actually just giving them a tour of the entire nation, letting them see our architecture. And as we were touring this group, we share with them uh, our history. We share with them our culture because we wanted them to incorporate that history and that culture in their design once they began to build, or once they began to design. And so we took them to uh, Jumamak Kill as one of the archaeological sites. Uh, we took them, again, throughout the nation, and they saw some of our traditional buildings, but they also saw some, uh, what would be, we would refer to as kind of contemporary buildings using um, rock, the, the local rock, to build our churches and our schools and other things. And so these were some of the sites that I think really had an influence on that architect that we had hired uh, he saw the churches, some of the churches that we have built from the local rock, and he saw the trencheras uh, up on Chimamak Hill. And so he, in his first design, he included these types of wall, rock walls in the design around the building. And we told him that there was plenty of rock <laughs> on our lands, that would be fine, but when we estimated the cost to build those walls, um, we were looking at $450,000 just in labor alone, and that would have put us way over budget. And so we told the architect, uh, we're not, sorry, we're, we're not gonna go over budget, so we're not gonna go with this wall that you wanna build, even though it really reflects our history. He was persistent though, and he wanted to somehow at least symbolize those walls that he saw on our tour. And so he says, if I can find a way to symbolize these walls at a less cost for labor, would you agree to it? And we said, yes. And so he in introduced this idea of using a slate uh, type wall to symbolize those buildings that he saw and those trencheras that he saw. So we have this slate throughout this entire building to replicate or to symbolize those trencheras and those original churches that were built. The interesting thing is that these slate are not local rock. In fact, they had to be imported from China. <laughs> Thank you very much. Here is a horned toad, uh, and you can see that it has a, the horned toad imagery has a, a long tradition in the region uh, going back in time, not just to Mamak Hill. Uh, Susie and I are going to mainly describe what we have seen at Tumamak Hill and how it fits into regional archaeology. And then hopefully we can have that same spirited discussion that Bernard talked about, about why uh, people might choose to live on a hill like Tumamak at the end, uh, a spirited discussion with you all. Tumamak Hill belongs to a category of archaeological site uh, that's uh, a term 
uh, commonly used in uh, borderlands of Sonora, Chihuahua, and Arizona, and New Mexico. Uh, the, this term is trincheras or Cerro de Trincheras. Uh, the sites that are reflected by trincheras uh, are uh, uh, specialized by their unusual location on, uh, on hills or, or volcanic peaks. They're distinguished by walls, terraces, and uh, structures and other features uh, made of dry laid stone. This is unlike most other constructions in the region, pre-Hispanic constructions, which are of packed earth or adobe, largely. Uh, they're, they're also, by virtue of being extensive areas of patinated rock, uh, locations of extensive uh, rock art, oftentimes. They're built by multiple uh, cultural groups across this large uh, region, many different archaeological cultures and different ethnic uh, groups in historic times. Uh, they also span most of agricultural time in the region, from 1300 uh, BC to about AD 1450. Often, uh, these places are iconic to both modern and past peoples. They've captured the imagination of archaeologists and the public alike. In uh, obs observance of this, uh, Tumamak Hill is nominated to the National Register of Historic Places at a national level of significance and was one of the handful of archaeological and historic sites that were given a high priority in preservation in the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. These types of sites uh, are, uh, have been a continuing thread through the career of both Susie and me uh, here in the Tucson Basin and in Sonora and uh, uh, also of our students, or many of our students. Uh, covering such uh, broad swaths of time and space, it's no wonder Trinchera sites are a highly diverse uh, phenomenon. And here in just three slides, I'm going to try to give you a flavor of some of this diversity. Uh, this particular site, uh, Cerro Wanakenia, is located in northwest uh, Chihuahua near the town of Hanos. Uh, its earliest occupation uh, dates to A.D. 1350, and a later overlaps in time with Tumamak Hill at about 1300 B.C. This is a fence line, a difference as in cattle grazing. Uh, each of the terraces that you see on the hill uh, reflects a, pro a probable house location. Probably this was, a, almost certainly this was a large village uh, as early as 1350 B.C. Uh, but most of the terraces seem relatively uniform. Nonetheless, it seems to be a relatively long-term or long occu or village occupied for much of the year. Uh, matadis that represent multi-seasonal grinding, the wear patterns on them, uh, deep middens, a diversity of archaeological res uh, plant resources uh, reflecting multiple seasons all indicate that this was a village occupied through much of the year. At the other end of the uh, temporal spectrum, about A.D. 1450, uh, we have Cerro de Trincheras in northern Sonora. Uh, this is one of the largest towns in our region, uh, or was, uh, pre-Hispanic towns. Uh, the terraces served as 
uh, areas for the construction of Ocotillo houses, a traditional form of uh, house in pre-Hispanic Sonora in which the walls uh, were constructed of Ocotillo and mud was packed in, presenting a, a very adobe-like uh, appearance. Uh, this is a real town with different precincts of people with different statuses and public architecture at the uh, summit. It was a central village or town that served a widely dispersed population uh, living in small hamlets and villages. Associated with these uh, 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 smaller hamlets are a series of uh, other kinds of, another kind of Trinchera site that uh, is characterized by few features. Uh, the features that are present are dominated by uh, large circular structures and uh, well-formed trails and rock art are other characteristics of this type of site. So every several hamlets would have uh, uh, one of these. I think in the Cerro de Trincheras area that we surveyed, there were about 16 of this type of site contemporary. We interpreted it as part of a ritual landscape in which ceremonies were enacted at the smaller villages uh, related to Cerro de Trincheras uh, where uh, more complex ceremonies occurred. There are pattern differences in our region, and one of them that I'd like to point out uh, uh, through time uh, is the early appearance of circular of uh, uh, walls encircling the village area. Village uh, walls surrounding uh, villages are uh, characteristic of not only sites in New Mexico, uh, Chihuahua, and Sonora at this earlier time, but also here in uh, Arizona at Tumamac Hill. Walls surrounding the su summit and extending down uh, uh, the slope in several tiers are connected uh, in some cases by boulder alignments where they're not continuous. And throughout the course of uh, occupation of the two villages, which date to the late Cienega phase, about 300 BC, and a second village of the early Tartalita phase at about AD 500, uh, uh, are, uh, are enclosed by these walls. Now Susie will describe, describe the villages. I'll just mention that um, this clicker is confusing to all of us. The, <laughs> the arrows point in the opposite of what you would think they would point. And so I'm going to try to do a little better, but I may not. <laughs> OK. So what is actually on top of Tumamak Hill? The first thing you would probably notice if you went up on the top and kind of went off to the side the first thing you would notice are these huge walls in which individual rocks often would take a couple of people to carry and put in place. And you can see they go across the sides. They're not totally continuous, as Paul mentioned. Uh, in some place, they just go down to a few boulders, but they also intersect with uh, steeper cliffs uh, around the perimeter. So there's 1.9 kilometers of these walls. And we made some estimates. Well, total volume is actually measured by using GPS readings on the walls themselves at different er intervals. And uh, we estimated the labor using some com com uh, experimental construction by uh, archaeologists in Chihuahua to find out how long it would take to make these. Uh, so that's just to build the walls, and then uh, t you had to clear the area, fill it, fill it in when it b became a terrace and so forth. So that's a minimal estimate. So we say that that is the first communal architecture that we find in the Tucson area and probably in the U.S. Southwest. Before this, people had gotten together and built canals, 
which certainly takes communal labor and co coordinated labor, but this is the first that we might call architecture. And it certainly took more time and effort of people working together than the communal rooms, which were also early shared architecture. So it's not a huge amount, it's not a pyramid, it's not um, something that would take years of many people, years and years, but it's substantial labor of people working together. And it's the earliest instance that we have. So we could call this public architecture, the first Tucson pub public architecture. Okay, there are two villages, and this is all we have of the first village in what we call the Cienega phase. We only have two houses in this village, and we'll try to defend calling it a village when we've only found two houses. We cannot find them by inspecting the ground because there are no stone foundations as there were later. So it was sort of dumb luck that we even found the first one because we put in a trench uh, going up to the terrace wall in which this house was set um, and encountered this house without knowing it was there at all, which was very fortunate. It was a small round pit house, not terribly deep, and it let us date the wall. So when are these big walls built? Well, by having had to have had the wall in place that created terrace into which the pit house was dug, we can look at the C14 dates from the pit house and say when the wall had to be built, or it had to be built before that date in the pit house. And that was about 300 BC. And um, these early, even at this early time, the pit house that we had was not a temporary uh, structure. It wasn't where somebody went just for a little t part of time during the year. And we know that by seeing a full set of artifacts that we would, we would find anywhere else at this time in the house. We had plant remains that showed every season of the year. Uh, these people uh, had uh, already connections outside the Tucson Basin. They had marine shell and obsidian that were not local. Um, and so we assume that if we found this one house, there must have been others because there was also a community room. So the community was out there, but we have not been able to find all the houses in it. This larger community room was cut down through really hard caliche substrate, 70 centimeters. And you can see the post hole pattern in it. And it matches the community room that is down on the floodplain below, uh, which, like this community room, has a, um, a stone upright, kind of like a little pillar, set in the floor. And so both this one and the one down below share that kind of unique feature. So this is bigger than the regular houses. And we put these two houses together, the, these two structures together, and say there was a, more of a village. We just couldn't find it yet. OK. In the Tortolita phase, which is later, about 300 AD, uh, 500 AD, we can actually count the pit houses because they have stone foundations that are still there. OK, you can see the um, foundations here of one of the smaller, rounder pit houses. Most of them are small and round, but we also have some that are more rectangular in shape. And uh, the majority have these covered entries that you see in this reconstruction up here, a drawing. So those are the stones that create the foundation when the house falls in. And we also have a really interesting Adam house that has stones at the bottom just like that. So we have two different ways of kind of imagining what these looked like. Now, by mapping all of these 152 houses and other kinds of things that were around them, we got the information that there were house clusters that were, that is, there were houses that shared their stone walls. And we digitized all the rocks and photographs we took from above. 
and this would be uh, a house cluster. And we found out by doing this that we could see the doorways even better than we could on the ground. Actually, we could tell where they were on the ground in many cases, but this was a more efficient way of, of uh, finding that out. And here is something really interesting. Um, these houses have shared stone walls. And you know, sound carries. So probably, if someone yelled in one of these little structures, the person next door heard. So we assume these are probably house clusters inhabited by people who knew each other well, probably related by kinship. And yet we look at the doorways and how they're oriented. So it's indicated by the, the arrows. So as people went out of this house cluster, they didn't all face onto some other common shared area. They were all in independent directions going out of their doorways. However, by Ho'okam times, which archaeologists mark by the um, appearance of painted red on brown pottery in the Tucson Basin, uh, you see a totally different organization of residential life. Again, we have clusters that are probably related people, but they all open out onto a shared area. And that's a different kind of residential organization than we see at this earlier time. And Bernard uh, said... As, uh, <laughs> as we were meeting to, yeah. to plan this presentation tonight, uh, Paula and Susie were showing me the slides that they were going to use. And I saw this, this cluster of, of houses. Uh, and I mentioned to them that um, even today, uh, the, in some of the more traditional... Um, housing areas, um, people, families will have a, 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 a single structure that they might use for their kitchen to prepare food, and they'll have a ramada outside. And as their family grows and, and, and sons get married or, or wives or the family grows, uh, more houses are added around that cluster. So you have what we see here today, you have a a home with a ramada, which serves kind of as an outdoor gathering area, outdoor living room, and then you have this, these other houses around that, that um, provide housing for the families that, as, it, as it grows. And so um, we still see this today in some of the older villages as, uh, before, um, before HUD came in. You know? <laughs> and so uh, that's, that struck my uh, curiosity. And I asked Susie, they actually had a Ramada there? And she said, yes, we saw the, the post holes. I said, that really looks like a cluster of housing that we still see today out on the nation. So you see, uh, once they found a really good arrangement, they, did, they kept it. <laughs> okay. Okay, here is the actual layout of all those house clusters and houses that are not in clusters. Actually, a majority are in clusters, but many are also freestanding. Uh, you see their arrangement within those dark brown walls. But you see all those other yellow lines that are around the houses, and those are smaller walls and terraces that people created to have flat land around their houses so they could go outside and work um, on whatever they wanted to or build a ramada. Uh, so they had to do a lot of, of wall building just to get enough uh, level land around their houses at the top of Tumamak, which is 16 acres, uh, to be comfortable. And different kinds of houses are shown here. The majority are blue, small, round pit houses, but some of those larger round pit houses and um, the more rectangular ones are shown by the red and yellow structures. So you can see those are scattered among the majority blue ones, which are the small round ones. And so they may be special purpose structures um, that are scattered among the more ordinary residences. Uh, we've only been able to excavate nine of the structures up here, so we don't know the full diversity of what's going on in these 152 uh, houses that were in the Tortolita village. And again, as we, were, as we were planning and we were discussing this, I could relate to this because 
Uh, my wife and I live in the community of Covert Wells, and it's up in the foothills in kind of the middle of the of the reservation. And so we live we live in the hills. And when when the house was built, of course the construction came and they leveled it off real nice and they built the home. But throughout throughout the years, the rains that we've had have begun to erode away some of that flat land. And so we we actually had to come back in the last few years and build these walls out of the local rock uh, to level our land in there so we can have a nice level backyard or a nice level front yard. Uh, and so I could relate very, very clearly to what we were discussing in this slide. Uh, continuities. Okay, the community room is shown by the arrow and it's in the middle of uh, an area that we think was a plaza. This is early in the Tortolita phase and plaza organization becomes more established as that phase goes on. Um, as shown by excavations elsewhere in the Tucson Basin. So that uh, community room that was used first by the Cienega people and then reused by the Tortolita people uh, is right there in the center. And that's another reason why we think we can say that the Cienega phase where we just have the community room in one house is actually part of a village. Okay. Now, uh, people say, well... Why would you live up there? It's so hard to get up and down, and you probably have to carry your water, although these people undoubtedly knew about reservoirs, but there's not a big watershed up on top. So uh, water probably had to go up and down, and these people had to go up and down themselves because they lived right above prime irrigated land on the floodplain below. So how onerous is it to live in a village on a hill? And we're letting everyone decide that, depending on how fit they are. But you can see uh, someone here is carrying a toddler up, a hill, up the hill. And the other sh pictures we showed of, of walkers up on Tumamak include someone walking with a cane. So, um, you know, how hard it is to, to live up there, given the access, is uh, sort of a personal question that, that could be answered a number of ways. Okay, this is the Tortolita community room. They used the same footprint because they didn't want to dig it again. Uh, and they probably could see just where it had been. Uh, but they built a floor higher up to use it during the Tortolita phase. And the post hole pattern changes as well, as is typical of this later phase. The other really unusual thing about the Tortolita village in Tortolita, I mean the Tumamak village in Tortolita times is the fact that in the other villages that are contemporary, most of the pottery is local, locally made. But at Tumamak, it comes from different parts of the Tucson Basin, and no one kind of, of location predominates in terms of the pottery that's there. So that makes it special, and we can think of ways that could happen. Either the people who lived on Tumamak went out into other parts of the Tucson Basin and acquired pottery more regularly, or those people who lived at the locations where pottery was made went up to Tumamak Hill and took some of their pottery during some occasions. And I think what we think makes the most sense is that it was something like a potluck, that there were events on Tumamak Hill where pre people brought food and other resources. Here are some examples of the really incredible rock art. And it was investigated uh, independently by another related project. And you can see the, the credits up there. Um, but what's striking about it is that people kept coming up to Tumamak Hill, even after those two villages were occupied and no longer used, and added to the rock art. In the lower left, you can see some late rock art, and we know it's later because it was a pottery design, and we know when that pottery was made, uh, overlaying or next to some earlier designs. And if you can look really closely, you'll see some modern initials. So people felt that Tumamak was the right place to create this rock art, and sometimes a particular location on Tumamak seemed to receive successive kinds of commemorations or messages. 
Um, it's also a place where there are astronomical associations. There are actually uh, solstice markers, which we were very skeptical of, until we went up on the morning of the summer solstice and saw this wedge of light move across the rock art element. Uh, very impressive, kind of spooky. <laughs> and uh, there are other astronomical associations. And Tumamak is also the perfect place because you can see almost in a 360-degree way, if, if you move around a little, uh, the horizon, which is another way that people kept track of time in the past. So when the sun or the moon rose or went down or over a certain spot, spot on the horizon, that's another way to have calendrics, as well as through astronomical observations. Okay, unsurpassed visibility. That's really, aside from the walls, and probably even more than the walls, it's what you really are struck by the first time you go up on top of Tumamak. You can see in all directions and really to great distances. You can go west uh, over the Altar Valley into the Baba Kivari Mountains. You can go south almost down uh, to Mexico, not quite. You can go north and see Picacho Peak, and you can go uh, look to the east and see the entire Tucson Basin up to and a ways up the mountains on the other side. So that's, that's an incredible visibility. Okay, now we get to the point where we hope you will enter in, and we ask, why live on Tumamak Hill? And please take a few minutes and read all of these possibilities, and you may think of some others. They are not mutually exclusive. They may be different at different times, and there can be different combinations of factors and situations which would enter into a decision to live on a hill like Tumamak. We might mention that Tumamak does not have neighbors that are like it. It is fairly unique in the Tucson Basin and the only one that, only even possible place of the sort that has been studied and documented in the same way. So why would someone live on Tumamak Hill? We look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. So the question is um, that photo of the petroglyph element with the solstice uh, sunshine on it, um, did you get a time sequence? Did you see it earlier or later and how that changes? Actually, if <clears throat> you looked at the credits on the photo, uh, that study was done by John Fountain and Janine Herrenbrod. And um, we just went up on the day of the solstice and see it happen. It was very... Um, it just made us really wonder because we could not figure out the source of that light. Oh, somebody else is going to answer this better than I can. Um, I know that they went up on the quarter, the other, the quarter equinoxes, and there was no light there. I'm sure it shows up a day or two ahead and after. Most of them do, but they checked the cross quarters and everything, and it was not there. That's Catherine Serino, who was part yes. of the Rock Art Project. Always good to have an expert stashed away there. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> so, okay, here's a winter solstice view. <laughs> there were a number of other spots that we thought had uh, solstice markers, and we went up on the winter solstice, and I was observing an old probably a Sienega phase um, petroglyph because it was faint. And um, there, there was a shadow cast into the middle of concentric circles. And the shadow had been, was cast by a rock that was in a rock alignment. So, you know, it had been placed to cat, you know, to, to mark the winter solstice. And that was kind of interesting. So there were solstice markers in the winter as well. Another we, question. 
I was going to say, we Susie. apologize. We couldn't get all of these names of all of these people who have been fascinated and worked at Tumamak Hill and all the field school students. So we apologize for that. So there may be other people in the room that can answer some other questions very well. Besides the pottery, are, is there other evidence of connections between this village and places um, across the Tucson Basin? Um, shall, I, shall I answer that? Or? Do you want multiple answers or? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I would say that the styles of artifacts are the same, um, and um, the the difference is, of course, the location. But otherwise, uh, that community room, which is exactly mirrored by a community room down below, so um, people are are doing things on Tumamak that suggest it is like these other villages. It's quite connected to them, but it has this unique location. So this sounds like somebody who's planted a tree in Tucson. <laughs> How did they get through that caliche in the uh, deep pit house there, the ceremonial structure, uh, community structure? Do you, is there any evidence? Uh, we have very limited evidence. However, uh, in the fill of the uh, community room were large numbers of uh, massive chopping tools. And I suspect that they're related uh, to the excavation. Uh, very early in the Totalita phase occupation, uh, the uh, community room was abandoned, uh, purposefully abandoned and filled with trash. And these large chopping tools were in and amongst the uh, trash in the, in the fill of the room. We suspect that that, at the end, uh, that's when the plaza comes into, into being. Uh, a plaza is described by very early recorders uh, of the, of the Tumamak site. Byron Cummings and a, a fellow archaeologist describe a central plaza. And that is a characteristic as of uh, of a time when people were becoming more like what we call the hall calm. So there's a question back here that you did find I indications of uh, farmed resources up there, cultivated resources. What about other wild resources or animal resources that were recovered from the excavations? Mm -hmm. There was very little preservation of bones, so we don't know much about the fauna, uh, but when we did have a botanical analysis done by Charles Mixacek of the early Siena room in particular, uh, there were all of the domesticates you would expect, corn, beans, and squash, and uh, mesquite beans, um, amaranths, choya, saguaro. Uh, so, so if you look at the seasonality of all those resources, it covers most of the year, starting in the spring with choya buds and then going on into the fall. And, of course, there's nothing much uh, that signifies the winter, but we, we do get a mix of seasons, even in the Cienega phase. Is there a map that's been made of the Tucson Valley and surrounding area uh, settlements of, at the same period? You mentioned uh, residential areas down by the river, um, and then you mentioned that there's pottery from other residential areas, but how far away were they? Were they similar? I mean, I guess, I guess to answer why I live there, you have to know... Where else could they have lived? Okay, there were villages all up and down the Santa Cruz River floodplain. A number have been excavated quite extensively. Others are just known more superficially. There are also settlements away from the river floodplain, although uh, freeway construction and other kinds of disturbance mean that, that there's been more work done along the floodplain than anywhere else. So. Uh, there is such a map. Sorry we didn't include it. But the fact is that uh, Tumamak would have been one of the larger villages at the time. Uh, we don't know of many larger, although we don't know that every structure was occupied contemporaneously. Uh, but um, there would have been 
similar villages and smaller ones as well, uh, probably scattered throughout the basin. We know they were scattered throughout the basin, but we haven't found them all yet. But there were many other choices. Do you want to do it? Yes. Okay. I, I think when Jim Heidke uh, did the analysis of pottery in comparison with other villages, he had about 10 other instances in which he had, pot he had looked at the uh, temper in the pottery and, uh, and could characterize uh, ceramics as coming from this place or that place. I was curious about defensibility mm -hmm. or if there was a graveyard found anywhere at all on, on the mountain or the hill. Uh, not only that, the wall to me suggests defensibility of having to keep uh, someone out, an enemy out perhaps. Uh, and maybe that's, there were enemies. You know, people don't always get along uh, amongst different villages, so perhaps they were protecting themselves at that advantage point. I think defense is always, for, for settlements on a hill, the very first and most popular explanation. And there are historic um, instances of refuge when people are attacked as well. Um, I will say that the walls at Tumamak don't stand above the ground, and they often create terraces. So um, they're not walls in the sense that you think that someone could hide behind them, that you know you could duck down and, and be behind the wall. They're walls in the sense that uh, people have, obser have observed that that gives you an advantage to have something to stand on and hurl things down at any attackers coming up the hill. So that's certainly a possibility and it doesn't mean that it's mutually exclusive from everyone else. But, you know, in the vein of thinking that were these people totally different from us today, uh, how many of you live in the foothills? Um, I mean, do you live up there because you're afraid of attack? <laughs> no. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's something about these elevated places. They are special in normal settlement. Uh, I think these people in the past had aesthetics and enjoyed the view and those things as well as anyone now. I don't know if that would be the reason to move up, but another possibility is they wanted to differentiate themselves from other villages. They wanted to be the ones to announce that it was the planting season or that it was the time for ceremonial gatherings because they had these calendric possibilities that everyone else didn't have to the same degree. I don't know, but I think um, we can think of once people are living up there, some of these other things might develop too. Uh, I think Bernard probably could say a few words. Uh, I was just thinking of that map that we showed you earlier. I don't know, I don't know if you noticed in the map, it does identify areas um, where people would go once the enemy came into the area. And so they, so there's certainly there's um, there's force in numbers, right? And so people will come together to pr to protect themselves. And so when I was talking to uh, our tribal archaeologist about the presentation tonight, he mentioned that he had he had interviewed an elder from San Javier some years ago, and this elder uh, told him about what his grandfather had told him about Jumamak, and how how it was, it was a place where signal, a signal would go out because they could see so far. And, and, and if they saw the enemy in the area, a signal would go out to let people know that, uh, that, there, was enemy, uh, that there were enemies in the area. And I was just thinking as we were talking, as I was listening about how, how these people may have come to these areas bringing food and other things with their, in those pots that they have to, to, to uh, planning on staying a little while until the enemy left. And so maybe this is why we have such a wide variety of pottery from all the different areas in the valley. So, I mean, that's just my, my thinking. Of course, you, because we're not there anymore and people have moved away from there so long ago, we don't know the exact answer, but we can certainly speculate. So, so we really have to cut it off here. Um, but while people are starting to exit, maybe one of you can just describe, was there a trail up there to the top? Um, but thank you all for coming, uh, bad. Um, and we will be back uh, in two months. And 
great job, folks. And as we exit here and they can start cleaning for the next event, uh, Susie, can you tell us what the trail up to the top was like in the past compared to the current road? Oh, there's a, a very large cleared trail on the north side. There's another trail that goes all the way down on the east side, and then there are smaller trails. Uh, and the, the other question I just want to get in is, why didn't the people who were attacking need a hill of their own when the people who lived around Tumamak attacked them? So plenty of hills. Why is there only one? That seems defensive. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. Good job.